chapter 19 of Matthew. I said to you last night, I won't preach to you anything you've never heard before, but maybe uh, uh, the preaching of the Word of God, the, the Scripture says, I believe it's in Peter, but the Scripture says that the preaching of the Word of God is to stir up your pure mind in way of remembrance. My Uncle Dave used to say, if your mind's not pure, don't expect for it to be stirred up in way of remembrance towards the thing of God. So uh, tonight, hopefully, this will be something that stirs your mind and stirs your heart. In verse 16 of chapter 19, And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may inherit or that I may have eternal life? And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. Now this is a very simple <coughs> statement. And we see, I don't, I don't suppose that Christ looked like this. I was teasing the ladies earlier. They all were here at the piano, the keyboard, the guitar. They all gathered around. I'm down in front of the altar, and so I took a, a little shot of me and them, and I said, we even got Jesus in the picture because there he was in the background. I don't suppose this is what he looked like. If he's Jewish, um, Jewish people usually don't have long flowing hair, but whatever it was that he looked like as he came through, he was drawing people to him. And you know what? It, it's not a very difficult thing to understand that if we're going to be Christ-like, that will draw people to us. People were drawn to Him. And so if people are going to be drawn to us, how will they be drawn? They will be drawn because they will see Christ in us. That's yes. not very difficult. Amen. If you are a troublemaker, what's the Scripture say in the book of Matthew in chapter 5 of the Sermon on the Mount? It says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Amen. If you reverse that, you can say, the troublemakers shall be called the children of the devil. Because if you look at someone who's a troublemaker, you don't like to think that that person belongs to or attends a church. And I guarantee you tonight, if, if there's a person that's a troublemaker out there, Kurt hates to hear that somebody says, hey, that person's the worst person I ever talked to and they're the biggest troublemaker. Well, who are they? I don't know, but they go to Duck Run Church. Oh, I remember pastoring Lombardsville and reading in the obituary of one of the people that attended my church that had passed away. And I had been there at that time for seven years, and I'd never seen the person, didn't know who they were. So they had attended there at some time, but they weren't attending there when I was there. Sometimes, if you're not careful, you carry the label of Christian, but if you don't, if you're not careful, that's all you carry is that label. And when you when people look at you, they will see you and they expect you to be Christ-like. Uh, Charles Stanley, no matter what you think about him, I was listening to him preach one day, and he said, I refuse now to call myself a Christian. He said, I would rather be known as a follower of Jesus Christ. He said, because people have given Christian a bad name. He said, when I say to you I am a follower of Jesus Christ, that leaves absolutely no doubt for you to know what I believe and how I act. So if we would look at that, maybe we should break out the, uh, the uh, bracelets and the necklaces and the tattoos or whatever it was from what the 90s WWJD and put those back on so we could look at it it doesn't matter what Jesus would do if we're not going to do it so you see what I'm saying if people are going to be drawn to your church or people are going to be drawn to you and you might not be the best singer you might not be the best looking you might not be the best preacher but if you've got love that Jesus Christ gave you and you can show it to others that draws people yes, yes. amen and these people were drawn to him. And as he passed, this one came to him and said, Good master. But then the second thing he said was, What good thing. And so Jesus stops him and says, Why do you call me good? There's none save uh, good save one, and, he, and that's God, and he's in heaven. So he puts him straight on that first. But he wants to know what good thing must he do to inherit eternal life, to have eternal life. Does anybody here tonight, if you believe there's a heaven and believe there's a hell, would there be anybody here in their right mind who would say that I would like to go to hell tonight? <laughs> Probably not. We would say that we would want to go to heaven. Or if you're of a different religion, some of those believe that we're not going to heaven. But let's put it this way. You want to be in the presence of God when you die. And you want to be right there with Him and at the marriage supper of the Lamb and all this. You want to be right in the presence of God. And so He's saying... What good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? Notice he's wanting to know what good thing. So what does Jesus do? He takes him back to the law. 
And I just said the other night that people have a hard time sometimes um, differing between law and grace. And sometimes we don't know how to play that very well. I thank God that God has more grace for me than anybody on Duck Run, anybody in McDermott, Lucasville, Little River, South Carolina. God loves me more than any of you folks or any of those folks. And he has more grace and more mercy for me. And so when I'm looking at this, I think of all these commandments. And he could have went through all ten of them. But he starts like this. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. Now this isn't a Gentile that comes to him. I believe this is a young man that has been trained, that has been taught, that has uh, been taken, no doubt, to the synagogue. He knows the right way. And he says to Jesus, he saith unto him, which Jesus said, thou shalt do no murder. You may say, okay, I got that one. That's good. <coughs> thou shalt not commit adultery. You may say, I got that one. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And the young man saith unto him, All these things have I kept from my youth up. What lack I yet? He kept all those from his youth up. This was a good church boy. This was a good synagogue boy. This was a person who lived a good moral life. That is the whole essence of this scripture. That is everything in a nutshell of what this chapter 19 is talking about. Jesus is saying to us, if you want eternal life, don't bank on the merit of you doing good deeds. Yeah. I said Addie won't remember this service, but her parents will teach her or train her. And what do you want her to do? And especially if you have another child or if she's around the two cousins that are here tonight or, or more of the other kids in the church whenever she's older, you don't want her going around knocking other kids in the head with a Tonka truck. You won't have to teach her to do that, though. You'll have to teach her not to do it because it just seems like our nature is to do those things that we shouldn't do. So you want to teach her to be good and to behave, but you can't teach her. You can't teach her that doing good Get you to heaven. That's right. Because if you do that, if you teach a child that just because you go to church you're right with God, that's a wrong move. Amen. And that's what Jesus is saying to this young man. He, no doubt he always went. I believe probably every Saturday he was there. He was probably in the synagogue. Maybe he's at the temple. But I believe that he was taught right yeah. and trained right. He was looking for something that he could grab a hold of and some kind of good work that he could do. You know, it would, be, it would be fairly easy, I guess, if you were to ask, if God had a list and he would say, I'm going to give this one to George and give this one to Dick and give this one to Paul, and here's your list, and, and, and just like a scavenger hunt, now you get this list completed, and if you do enough of these good deeds on here, I'll let you in. But it is grace plus nothing else. God's Grace is extended to us. If you remember the scripture where uh, Paul and Silas are thrown in jail. And they are beaten. They're thrown in jail. They're probably hurting about this time. But they start singing about the midnight hour. The scripture says they are singing and praying and, sing and singing praises unto him. And then the scripture says that the, uh, the gates fly open. The, the, the uh, guard rushes in. And he's afraid that they've escaped. And he's willing to kill himself because he knows he's going to be killed if he lets them get out. And when he finds out they are there, Paul says, hey, don't do yourself any harm. We're all here. And that jailer says, what must I do to be saved? And Paul, and this is sarcasm, and Paul whips out a little thing and says, okay, pay your tithes, go to church, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, which they didn't do at that time, but let's just say they did, uh, and, and, and do all, he didn't do that. He said you must believe on Jesus Christ. Amen. Now folks, not believe by watching the History Channel and saying, okay, I believe that there was someone named Jesus. Not that. Believe on Him for salvation. Yeah. Believe on Him, believe in Him, however you would like to look at it. But you have to accept Him as your right. Savior. That's right. Personal Savior. Yes. I, <laughs> I can't do it uh, probably anymore. Well, sure I can. 
<laughs> We're just a little bit bigger. Sure it can. So Paul, this is class participation. Come on, big boy. Come on. When Paul was a little boy, now Homer, you're going to have a real trouble with this. This close up to these two guys. When Paul was a little boy, I told you the other night, have you ever known glass signs to be real little? But here he is. When he was a little boy, I would stand him up in front of the congregation and I would say, this is my son Paul. Have you met him? This is my son. This is my only son. I love my only son. And if you're going to do anything to harm my little boy, you're going to have to come through me first. And no matter if I just had a couple screws and some hardware put in this foot and maybe can't move too well, I will try to drag you to the ground and fight you tooth and nail so you don't hurt my little boy wherever he is behind me, right? <laughs> now here's what God did for you. This is my son. This is my only son. Have you met him? You need a savior. And so I'm going to give you my only son. Yep. And they plucked his beard. Yep. For those of you that are enraged because this boy has this, they plucked his beard. They spit on him. They beat him. They cursed him. They mocked him. They put a crown of thorns on him. They hung him on a cross. Why? For you. So how dare any of us say, what can I do good so I can get to heaven? Here's the only thing you can do. Here's the only thing you can do. Except that sacrifice. You know, I talk with people who have such a difficult time with salvation. They say there's got to be more to it than that. Not if you read the scripture, there's not. There you go. Now, if you read the doctrinal statements of a lot of churches and a lot of uh, denominations, you will find that, man, you've got to do a whole lot of stuff. Yeah. And I found out that most of those people, some of even their pastors, don't even know how to articulate their message. They can't even get it out the way the denomination teaches them from the top down how they should deliver it. And some of them don't even know how to deliver it. So what do we need to do to get to heaven? What good work do we need to do? You can't do it. Amen. So what do you do? You realize tonight that all of sin comes short of the glory of God. And here we are. Jesus starts naming off these things that we sometimes, and, and sometimes it's sad to admit it, but we sometimes as a church would start saying, yeah, that person's real bad because they did this. There's a certain amount of liberty. I don't know, Curtis, if you felt this way when you moved away from here and, and went to a other area, but... There was a certain amount of liberty to be in South Carolina and to go into a restaurant because there's a billion and one of them, and uh, no one say, "Hey, George," and you know, and your food's cold while you're talking to them, and your family's done eating, they're sitting there waiting. Like, oh, I knew this was going to happen, you know. So there was no one there that knew me. I walked in. I remember after a few months, I told Teresa in Ohio, I was somebody. It's like the mafia, right? I was somebody. I said, here I'm nobody. Nobody knows me. <laughs> was that bothersome? It kind of was for a while. And then I thought, you know, if a, if a man wanted to, this would be a great place to hide. And then we started getting texts from people. said, hey, we're in town. You want to go out to dinner? It's either hide for people or go to dinner with them. What do you think I did? <laughs> well, we went to dinner with them. Yeah. But when we'd walk into church, I knew that walking in, that people could have had this preconceived idea about me. You could hear my name here, and you could tell whether you wanted to come and hear me or not, see me or not, be around me or not. Some of you say yes, some of you would say no. Some people that had never heard me would say, now we know that name, he can't be too good. And so forget it. There, they didn't know me. So it was like a... Like a roll of the dice, right? If you could do that and be a Christian. <laughs> but they would come. And they'd just have to take whatever they got. And I would leave sometimes feeling pretty good. There was no way to the pressure of these people with an expectation. It wasn't there. You know what expectation I just had to live up to? One for my own. And then I look at the Word of God and say, you know, he's not as hard on me as what... Other people are sometimes. Right. 
That's hard to get through your head. Yes. This person here while back to help talk this. He just could not get through that. Okay, I'm forgiven, but man, tomorrow I just feel terrible. I just don't think I'm going to make it. I don't think, and and it it hurt me to the point where because I talked to them about it for so long, I said, "Listen, God is not like your father. Your father at a time was not a good man." If you didn't have a good relationship with him, don't expect that when you go to God, he's waiting to belt you or stand you in a corner or zap you with a lightning bolt. This is not the earthly father that you had. This is the heavenly father that looks at you. He gave his only begotten son for you. He loves you that much. He's not waiting to condemn you, to pass a judgment on you. He's waiting to wrap his arms around you and hug you and love you. That's what he wants to do. Amen. What a great feeling to come and to pull in and the grandkids say, Poppy, and they come and hug you. Yeah. And that'll happen with Addie before long. We came back, we talked to her on the phone, we talked to her on Facebook, and Teresa would say, oh, look, she, she knows who we are. Well, she's only eight months old, right? I mean, so she's learning, but, but she moved, and, and so we don't see her as much. But the other little kids, oh, they're excited when they get to see us. And you know, mom, with mom, it's not just like a regular hug like it used to be when he's around here. Sometimes you'd hug, sometimes you wouldn't, whatever. Now it's no, it's a hug. And even my brother's here tonight. And and uh, I probably, I don't know, it's, I don't know if he's a real big hugger, but, but the other night whenever he came in to, the, to our grandson's little birthday party and he came over and hugged me, that just feels good to know that people yes. like you. What do you think the Lord is waiting to do for you? Yeah, that's right. So folks, don't get all knocked down with religion tonight. No. Don't get all beat up with this, I got to do this, I got to do this, I got to do this. Jesus isn't saying the commandments aren't important, but He's saying first that you need to do these and this young man says, but I've done them all. What do I lack yet? And Jesus says unto him, if thou wilt be perfect, go and sell what thou hast and give to the poor. Thou shalt have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. Mm -hmm. On the steps of Lombardsville Community Church, probably um, six years ago, there was a gentleman that owned a big business around here. He met me on the steps after a Sunday morning message when I preached that. And he said, so you're telling me that I should sell everything I've got, put all the people that work for me out of business, and I should give all that to your church. And I should just be happy. And I said, you don't get it, do you? <laughs> and he looked at me and I said, I'm not telling you that at all. And I said, in essence, I don't know is it for sure that that's what Jesus is telling this man. I said, I think what he's saying to him is, if you give me your heart, I've got everything else. I said, I'm just saying to you, if you give your heart to him, he'll have everything else. Bill Stuyvesant used to say, if you give God your heart, he's got your pocketbook. He'll get your tithe and he'll get your offerings. It doesn't matter. If you give God your heart, he's got everything about you. But if you don't give God your heart, you're just trying to get in on good deeds and that doesn't work. That's right. How how do we how do we make it to heaven? Well, he says to this young man, take what you got, sell it, give it to the poor. What is he saying here? It was his not only his livelihood, it was his life. That was all he invested in, no doubt. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. So let me leave you at this. Teresa and I were talking about this the other day. Years ago, I tried to preach a message of, don't you think when that young man walked away that Satan sitting on his shoulder said, wow, what a nutcase that guy is. He wants yeah. you to sell everything. He wants you to give everything to the poor and follow him. Yeah, I bet he does. You come with me. He's crazy. Then no doubt he hears about the crucifixion, this same young man. And the Satan that comes and sits on his shoulder then says, man, aren't you glad? You didn't give up everything you had for that nut job? How do you think he felt when he heard three days later that that guy raised? Whoa. All of a sudden now, there's a difference. 
All of a sudden, and folks, that's how it is. I'm not asking you to follow me or to follow Kirk tonight. I'm just saying to you, even those of you that have been saved for years, there are people that right up until the time they die, they keep, they're scared to death that they're not going to make it in because they haven't went to church enough or they haven't given enough or they haven't done whatever enough. It's not on what we do. It's on who He is. It's on us accepting Him. Amen. I'm afraid sometimes that we make him such a tyrant that people run from him instead of running to him. Yes. And they should run to him. Amen. How would you love somebody that's going to zap you the first time? Hey, he gave his he gave his only son for you. That's a great message. And then you get saved. Right. And now you got to live to the letter of the law so strict that if you get out of line, he's going to zap you. Come on, folks. He gave his only son for you to save you, to forgive you. Does he want you to live like the devil? No. But he's going to give you the ability to live the life you need to live. Amen. Yeah. And just shut the world out when the people come by and say, you ought to do this, you ought to do that. If it ain't in the Word of God, don't worry about it. Amen. Amen. Right. When it comes down to it, who is it between you and him? Right. And you just need to accept that. 